Hello, my name is Marijn van Vliet and welcome to my introduction to electroencephalography and event-related potentials. I'm not a psychologist. I studied computer science at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And when it was time to do my master's thesis, one of my professors told me that they were thinking about building a brain-computer interface which is a way to control your computer just by thinking about different things. And I was immediately fascinated by the topic uh, and fascinated by recording brain activity, visualizing it, analyzing it, um, classifying it, doing machine learning on it. So much so that after my master's, I went to Belgium to the Catholic University of Leuven. And there I pursued a PhD in biomedical engineering doing mostly EEG work. After my PhD, I moved up north to Finland, and there I started a postdoc in neuroscience. And this is where I still am today. I'm studying mostly language in the brain now. December is definitely here. Outside, it's very dark, it's very cold. So I'm just gonna stay inside now and tell you all about EEG. She seized for over a minute. And her ictal EEG showed no synchronous discharges. Get him an EEG, left and right EOG esophageal microphones. Should do an EEG. We should get an EEG. And you're giving him an EEG, is that for the same thing? Look at his EEG. Get an EEG, confirm your brain function is okay. Hook her up to an EEG, flash some lights, make her pants, shoot her up with a placebo. There's nothing abnormal in the EEG or the neurological exam. How would you jump to genetics from his... EEG. All well, you've got are some vaguely epileptiform waves. It's not his EEG. It's his father's. If the EEG reveals a problem, we can talk then. No, your EEG was normal. EEG. 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 EEG sucks. EEG. 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 EEG was normal because he was faking it. What I'm hoping to achieve with this lecture is teach you enough about EEG that you can go on and read scientific articles in cognitive science, articles in which they use EEG in an experiment, and then that you know what they're talking about and you can understand their figures. But before we get into that, I want to do a little pre-lecture quiz. So, I'm going to ask you a few questions about EEG, and it's okay if you don't know the answer. All the answers will be topics that I will discuss in this lecture. But I just want you to think about the questions already a little bit. And then after the lecture, you have learned all about EEG, we will go back to the questions and you can see how much you have learned. Alright, ready? Let's go! Here we go. Question one. In which of these pictures is an EEG measurement session taking place? Take a look at all the photographs and just decide for yourself which one do you think looks like an EEG measurement. Got it? Right, next question. What biological property do we measure with EEG? Do we measure differences in blood flow or electrical potential? Are we measuring magnetic fields or are we measuring temperatures? What do you think? What kind of phenomena can we see in the EEG signal? Do we just see brain activity or do we see brain and muscle activity or brain muscle and heartbeats or brain muscle heartbeats and eye movements, or brains, and muscles, and hearts, and eyes, and, and basically any strong electromagnetic fields that are present. Interesting question. Can we read your thoughts using EEG? What do you think? Can we? No, we can't. Or maybe we can, but not right now, 
but possibly in the future when our technology improves? Or is the answer, well, no, but yes, sort of, you know, it depends. What is the alpha rhythm? Is it a dance beat popular in the 90s? Is it a rhythmic EEG signal that appears in absence of other activity? Or is it the most dominant EEG rhythm? Or is it an EEG rhythm that occurs when we are sleeping? What is an event-related potential? What do you think? Is it any change in the EEG signal after an event, because it's event-related? Is it a very sudden change in the EEG signal after an event? Is it a possible change in the EEG, because it's a potential? Or is it maybe a consistent change in the EEG signal after an event? What are the P300 and the N400? Are they protocols for measuring EEG? Are they highways connecting Germany with Austria? Are they the names of two EEG electro positions? Or are they the names of two peaks in the EEG signal? All right, don't worry about getting any of these rights. Let's dive right in now and talk about EEG. First, Let's take a look where EEG data comes from. Hi, this is just a short video to explain how to set up and clean up the EEG system when you're running an EEG experiment. In addition to the cap and the electrodes, you'll need a few extra things to set up the EEG system, which we'll go over now. For your setup, you will need the following. Measuring tape, new prep exfoliating gel, paper towels, alcohol wipes, four adhesive rings, and a syringe filled with conductive gel. The first step is to measure your participant's head. Start measuring from the center of the forehead and make sure you measure the part of the head with the widest circumference. This measurement will dictate what size cap the participant requires. All caps have a label showing the size and the centimeter range associated with that size. Before putting on the cap, we'll need to attach the four external electrodes. First, clean all four areas with new prep gel. Clean behind both ears, next to and underneath the left eye. Then, wipe off the new prep gel using alcohol wipes. Now, attach the adhesive rings to the external electrodes. Then, apply a small amount of conductive gel to the electrode and peel off the white covering. When attaching electrodes one and two, make sure that they're on top of the mastoid bone to minimize interference to these reference electrodes. Attach the third external electrode next to the participant's left eye and the fourth one underneath the same eye. Now that you've put on the external electrodes, there's just one more thing to do before putting on the electric cap. Measure from in between the participant's eyebrows to the back of the head. This will help you when positioning the cap. Once the participant is wearing the cap, make sure that it is on as straight as possible. Then, measure the distance between the middle of the eyebrows and the edge of the cap. In this case, it should be 3.3 centimeters, one tenth of the previous measurement. And don't forget to untuck this poorly placed label so that it doesn't get in the way of the IZ channel. You are now ready to attach the electrodes. Do one side at a time, start at the back of the head and attach the electrodes in the same order as they are ordered on the cable to minimize tangling. Carefully poke the tip of the syringe all the way to the participant's scalp and gently move it around to push hair out of the way. Start to administer gel as you pull the syringe out to make sure that there's no empty gap between the scalp and the electrode. Then repeat this 64 times until the entire cap is completed. 
The next step is to connect the external electrodes to the amplifier, as well as the two electrode sets. Connect the amplifier to the battery and switch it on. Once all the cables are connected to the amplifier, make sure you tape them to the participant's shoulder and ensure that there's a fair amount of slack so that there'll be no pulling on the cables even if the participant moves their head. So, now that we've seen what an EEG measurement looks like when you're inside the room with a volunteer, let's discuss what EEG actually measures. EEG measures the difference in electrical potential between two points on your scalp. Now, let's scroll back a bit to the video where they were preparing the participant. Take a look at this. They're placing one of the electrodes on the mastoid bone, right behind the ear. Can you guess why they did that? Well, if EEG measures the difference between each sensor and, well, what, right? We, if we measure the difference in electrical potential between two points, it means we always must measure the signal in relation to some sort of reference location. And the mastoid bone is a decent sort of neutral reference, by which I mean it's a spot where there's very little real brain activity being measured, but still it's a spot that's quite close to the other sensors in the cap. And this makes it an ideal neutral reference location. Other reference locations that are often used are the tip of the nose or the earlobes. So, when we take a look at EEG data, we will always look at the difference between the voltage measured at each sensor in the cap and the reference electrode, or often multiple reference electrodes. But there's another interesting electrode placement in the video with the volunteer. Take a look here. What is that electrode doing on the cheek of the volunteer? That's certainly not recording brain activity. But can you guess what it does record? Let's take a look at some actual EEG activity now. So this is how we usually look at it. On the x-axis we have time and stacked on top of each other are the different signals coming from each sensor. And remember, what you're seeing here is the difference in electric potential between the sensor and the reference location. Now I want to also point out this number in the corner. This is indicating the scale at which we're looking. And we're dealing here with an order of magnitude in microvolts. So we are looking at really tiny differences in electric potential. Now, can we see something interesting here? Well, what jumps out to me immediately are these peaks. What could they be? Are these bursts of brain activity? Is something happening that makes the brain light up? No. This is eye activity. They are blinks. Turns out, your eyes are positively charged at one end and negatively on the other end. So, in essence, your eyes are magnets. And whenever your eyes move around, magnets are moving around. And moving magnets mean electrical activity, electrical currents, magnetic fields, etc. Things that are picked up by your EEG sensors. So, for example, Malcolm, could you blink repeatedly for me? So as Malcolm is blinking, we're seeing these blinks come up in the front of the brain. So the muscle activity is producing them all the way across. So now you know why we are interested in recording signals coming from your eye. That sensor close to the eye will record almost no brain activity, but will capture a near perfect recording of your eye activity. 
And once we have that, we can subtract it out of the measured EEG signal and so get rid of a lot of the eye artifacts, the noise caused by movements of the eye. Here is our EEG data again. Now, if the large peaks are in fact eye movements, then these smaller squiggles, they must be real brain activity. Well, actually, most of that is muscle activity and not brain. Okay, Malcolm, could you now clench your face really tightly, grit your teeth together? Excellent. So again, we can see that the muscle activity is causing differences in brain activity that Malcolm's producing. Because your muscles are driven also by electrical signals being sent down from your nervous system. And when you tension it up, you will get a lot of EMG activity, as it's called. Um, and this is also picked up by your EEG sensors. And again, this type of activity is orders of magnitude larger than your brain activity. Guess what you have plenty of in your face and on your head? That's right, you have plenty of muscles everywhere. And all these muscles are moving all of the time. You will note that you will get much cleaner EEG recordings when you ask your volunteer to completely relax their face relax their neck muscles, relax their shoulders, really become completely zen in their chair. Because the less tension there is in your muscles, the cleaner your EEG will look. And speaking about muscles, how about this big muzzle? It's quite far away from your EEG sensors, but your entire blood circulation rhythm, it also shows up in your EEG signal. And this is one muscle that we can't ask the subject to relax, of course. So let's finally look at some actual brain activity. This snippet of EEG data is the first EEG data ever recorded. It was recorded by Hans Berger in 1924. And we see on the top of the plot the EEG signal, and the second row is a 10 Hz sine wave that Hans Berger used to track the timing of the signal. We can split up this signal into different parts, like this. And now you see that in some parts, there seems to be a 10 Hz sine wave also occurring in the EEG signal. And this 10 Hertz sine wave, or around 10 Hertz sine wave in the EEG signal, Hans Berger called the alpha rhythm. Okay, finally, Malcolm, could you try and relax yourself as much as possible, close your eyes and breathe really deeply? Excellent. So again, we can see the alpha activity that Malcolm is producing here. Now, alpha activity tends to be when a participant is quite relaxed but awake. Only 75% of the population can produce this, but as we can see here, Malcolm can produce some excellent alpha activity. The first thing that researchers noted when they looked at EEG activity for the very first time, when it was just invented, was this rhythmic activity. We've already seen the alpha rhythm, but over time we found more. For example, there's the delta rhythm that is very slow. And we can observe this when we are deep asleep. It's occurring in one of our sleep cycles. And also babies show a lot of this activity. Then we have theta activity, which is observed when people are very relaxed or when people are meditating. Then we have alpha activity that emerges when we close our eyes and we are in a relaxed state. We have beta activity that's a bit faster still, and that is, for example, very well observed just across the motor cortex when we are doing physical movements or if we are imagining doing physical movements. It's one of the rhythms that, that originate when our motor cortex is active, driving muscles or pretending to drive muscles. Above that, we have very high frequency gamma rhythms that we see all over the brain 
And in some studies, they are used to infer connectivity between brain regions and coordination between neurons. Now, it's very difficult to really assign functions to this sort of brain rhythms. There are phenomena that we observe in many different situations, in many different locations of the brain, and we cannot attribute them one-to-one -to, -one to things that the brain is doing. Still, rhythmic activity is one of the things that they look for in EEG in hospitals. Because many types of rhythmic activity are so large, you can just see it by eyeballing the EEG, just looking at the data. For example, if they suspect that you may be suffering from epilepsy, they will record EEG from you. Because many seizure types can be visible in EEG, and some types are even extremely visible in EEG. Another example are sleep studies. When you have trouble sleeping, they will put you in a sleep lab, and they will record continuous EEG from you. And various sleep stages, they have different EEG rhythms. For example, here is a snippet of 30 seconds of slow wave sleep, where we can clearly see the slow delta rhythm being active. So, to summarize, EEG measures the difference of electric potential between all the electrodes placed in the cap on the scalp versus one or more reference electrodes placed in neutral reference locations, for example, the mastoid bones or the tip of the nose or the earlobes. And EEG records mostly sources of interference. The big peaks will be eye movements and blinks. Medium peaks will likely be muscle movements. You can find the heartbeat in there and any nearby electromagnetic activity, really, especially if there's a problem with your reference electrodes. For example, if some sensors don't connect really well, you can clearly see the 50 hertz generated by all the power lines in the room. But EEG also records brain activity. And when you just look at the data, the type of activity you are likely to spot is the rhythmic activity. So when EEG is used in hospitals and they're just looking at the monitor, the EEG monitor next to the patient bed, they're looking at rhythmic activity. But many types of activity can only be revealed through data analysis. So if you want to do cognitive science using EEG, it's very likely we have to dig a little deeper. Turns out, if you look at the entire EEG, there is so much stuff going on in your brain at the same time, it is basically impossible to make sense of it just by looking at the data. Instead, we will have to perform data analysis. We have to manipulate the data a little bit in order to get at the signals that we're interested in. And for the rest of this lecture, I would like to focus on one of these types of analysis called event-related potential analysis. And it is very, very widely used in the cognitive sciences. And there are tons of studies being performed this way. Take a look at this. This is an experiment I did with my students when I was doing my PhD in Belgium. And I call this the magic trick. I have a volunteer, all dressed up in an EEG cap and hooked up, and I show this on a computer screen in front of them. And I ask them to pick one of these cards and keep them in memory. So try it yourself. Pick one card, keep it in memory. Got one? Okay. Now, all the different playing cards start flashing one by one. It goes quite fast. And you are asked to count the number of times your playing card appears on the screen. Are you counting yet? Okay. While you are doing this, we are recording EEG. And every time one of the cards is being shown on the screen, I put a marker in the EEG stream, denoting which card was being shown at the time. Now you can imagine that every time the card you picked shows up, you will get a little spike in your EEG signal. It's called the P300 potential. It's basically your brain saying, oh, 
That's my card. And this B300, we can detect, we can see. So I can infer which of the nine playing cards you picked. And we've come to the first break of this lecture. Get a nice cup of coffee, relax for a bit. Let's take a few minutes, let's say five or 10 minutes, just pause the video and take a well This is a snippet of EEG data I've recorded from one of my volunteers. And I've annotated with vertical lines every time one of the cards flashed on the screen. So, can you spot the B300 peak? Is there one of the cards for which we get a significant bump in the signal somewhere? No, neither can I. Like I said, really interesting stuff is usually not plain visible in the EEG if we just eyeball it like this. We have to do a little bit of data analysis. So the first thing I want to do with this data is to apply a frequency filter to it. Take a look at this. Here I have an example of a signal where we have multiple waves stacked on top of each other. We have this slow big wave going along and then on top of it we have much more faster waves. A frequency filter can tease apart these waveforms and keep some of these and discard others. For example, I can apply a low-pass filter. A low-pass filter will only keep waves that are slower than a given threshold. For example, here I set the threshold to 2 Hz, so it will only keep waves that are slower than 2 Hz. Well, in this example, there's only one such wave and it looks like this. The filter picks it out really nicely. Another way to look at this, how a low-pass filter works, it's a smoothing filter. It will just take a running average of the signal. Of course, we could do the opposite. We could apply a high-pass filter. So the high-pass filter will only keep waves that are faster than the threshold. So again, we set it to 2 Hz, and now we only retain the smaller, faster waveforms, and we discard this slower waveform. Of course, what we often want to do is combine these two, so that we can set a frequency range that we are interested in. For example, here I show the frequency range 2 to 10 Hz. It picks up some of the waves that are within this frequency range. So let's see how that looks when I apply it to the EEG signal. So here's my original EEG signal. It contains waves of many different frequencies. We have, of course, lots of tiny waves that go really fast but hidden beneath them are some bigger waves that are a bit slower. Now, in this analysis, I'm looking for a, a large peak that's quite slow. So I want to get rid of some of this faster stuff. So I'm going to apply a bandpass filter that will only retain the larger wave for me. This is how it looks. Okay, this is already cleaner. Can we see a spike now? that would indicate. Well, there's some candidates here. I can certainly see some bigger spikes now. But it's still very hard to tell which card really jumps out, which is really different from the rest. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut epochs. Epochs are snippets of EEG. Every time a card is shown, I'm going to cut out roughly a second of EEG data. So I have a collection of little snippets of EEG. Then I can group these snippets, these epochs, according to the card that was shown during the epoch. 
So now I have for all my nine playing cards, I have a collection of epochs. While our volunteer was counting playing cards, there's of course all types of brain activity going on. And it's very difficult uh, to see in the raw signal which parts of the signal were related to the playing cards and which part of the signal were related to, hmm, what shall I have for lunch or breathing or other types of things that just go on in the brain. One way to isolate the two is to create an average. What we're going to do is compute for each group of epochs the average of them. And we assume that only activity that's related to the processing of the stimulus will be consistently the same every time. And brain activity that is unrelated to it will be different every time we show a card. And these differences over time, they will average out to zero because sometimes there will be positive, sometimes there will be negative, net effect is zero. So by averaging across the epochs, we only retain the portion of signal that's consistently the same every time we present the stimulus. So if we do this for all the nine playing cards, we get the event-related potential in response to each playing card, the portion of the signal that's consistently the same. Now, let's compare these ERPs. So I've plotted them here all on top of each other so we can easily compare them. Hmm. I've got eight channels here. Let's zoom in on one of the channels. Okay, interesting. I can see that response to some playing cards is larger than others. But is this because the signal is actually stronger or is this because the signal did not start out at zero? Take a look at this time period, the negative time period. This is the time leading right up to the, uh, the presentation of our stimulus. And I can see that for some playing cards, the signal already starts positive. And for others, it starts negative. So those playing cards are at a disadvantage. To make a fair comparison between all these curves, we should make sure that they start at zero. And this is called baseline correction. What we do is we compare the mean signal during this baseline period and then subtract that value from the entire signal. So in effect, that will center the signal on zero during the baseline period. Now all the signals start at the same point. So now I can make a more fairer comparison later on. Are signals really stronger than other ones? Let's take a look. Well, there's one signal now that really jumps out to me. And that's this light green one over here. Let's see, this light green line corresponded to the king of spades. So apparently the volunteer was counting the king of spades. The ace of hearts. <laughs> <laughs> no. The effect we see here is in the literature called the P300 oddball effect. What happened is that by choosing one of the playing cards, we actually split the collection of playing cards into two groups, our chosen card versus all the other cards. And we no longer distinguish between the other cards. So now when we're looking at all the cards in a sequence, what we have is the common occurrence of a non-interesting card being shown and sometimes an oddball occurrence of an interesting card showing. And whenever this oddball occurs, we get this P300 peak that we saw in the ERP. But why is it called the P300? Well, when we want to talk about event-related potentials and the things we see in them, we have to come up with a naming scheme for the various peaks and valleys of the signal. And the naming scheme we usually use 
consists of a letter and a number. The letter is either a P or an N, indicating whether it's a peak or a valley, negative, N. And the number indicates the timing of this peak, of this valley. So we can either use the time in milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. So this is where the P through 100 gets its name. It's a positive peak occurring roughly 300 milliseconds after onset. Of course, the downside of that is that the exact timing of this peak will not be always exactly 300 milliseconds. It will vary from case to case and from volunteer to volunteer. In this case, it's rather late. It's almost at 400 milliseconds. So that's why there's also another scheme. And this is that we number the peaks and valleys in the order they appear. So now this is called P3 or the third positive peak. Of course, this has the downside that the number of peaks and valleys is highly dependent on which filter you apply and how noisy the signal is. It's, we don't have a perfect naming scheme. If any of you can come up with a better naming scheme that we can consistently identify peaks and valleys and compare it across studies and with others, I'd love to hear it. Now that we have seen some EEG data, this may be a good time to talk about where the signal is generated in the brain. The signal we see with EEG is caused by postsynaptic potentials. Neurons in the brain communicate with each other in various ways, but the most common way is that the axon of one neuron is connected to the dendrite of another neuron. And when a signal is sent down the axon of the first neuron, this causes the release of neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters are ionic charged particles. And they're being received by receptors on the dendrite, and this is how communication flows. And a flow of ionized particles causes a tiny electrical current. Of course, with EEG, there's no way we can measure this for a single neuron pair. But if we have enough neurons firing all together at the same time, in the same direction, all the electrical charges, they add up, and finally we can measure in the order of microvolts a little tiny potential difference. And this is only possible because there is this one type of neuron called a pyramidal neuron, and they tend to be um, stretched vertically. They tend to be organized in columns. And you can find them uh, close to the cortical surface, arranged in these columns that follow the curvature of this cortical surface. So now we have large groups of neurons that are all facing the same direction, and when they all fire at the same time, they are now in a position that all the currents can add up and we can actually get a tiny blip on the EEG. So, EEG sees the activity of pyramidal neurons, mostly those that are on the cortex, that are on the surface of the brain. And this is, this is why event-related potentials are such a useful way of looking at the signal. We can only see a signal if, if many neurons fire at the same time, and usually this happens when some external event takes place. So, in summary, event-related potentials are the consistent brain responses to an event, and they are generated by the summation of postsynaptic potentials, of thousands of pyramidal neurons firing together along the cortex. Now, noise sources are inconsistent with the event, so they differ all the time, so when you average the epochs together, they will cancel out, and what remains is the consistent brain response, is the ERP. And that brings us to the following ERP analysis pipeline. We first frequency filter the data, usually with a bandpass filter, 
Then we apply some algorithms to deal with eye and heart artifacts that are a bit out of scope for this lecture. Then we cut epochs around the event markers of interest. We apply baseline correction to these epochs. We group the epochs based on the type of event. And we average them together to obtain the ERP for each type of event. And now we can compare the ERPs, for example, by plotting them on top of each other. And of course, for proper science, we need to perform a rigorous statistical analysis of any of the differences we find. For example, t-tests or ANOVAs or even going into uh, multi-level models. Also out of the scope for this lecture. And ERP components, the peaks and the valleys, have a naming convention to them. They start with a letter, either P for positive or N for negative, followed by a number. And the number can either represent the amount of milliseconds the peak occurs after the onset of the stimulus, or it is just the nth peak in the series. And now let's discuss how ERP research can help us map out how language is processed in the brain. The first thing I want to discuss with you is the N400 potential. It was the subject of my PhD thesis, and it was first described by Marta Kutas and Stephen Hilliard. They published this article in a magazine called Science. Now, they describe a study in which they present their volunteers with sentences, but they would flash one word at a time. Now, there was something special about these sentences, because the final word was either normal, a normal ending to the sentence, or it was a surprising ending to the sentence, something you would not predict from the previous words. And they recorded EEG while presenting these sentences, and they did ERP analysis, they cut epochs, and they averaged them together, so they created ERPs. And these are the ERPs that they found. Now, I apologize for the poor quality of this graphic. It's cut out from a paper from 1980, and the graphics were not that great in those days. But hopefully you can make it out. So in the solid black line is the ERP in response to normal sentences. And the dashed line is in response to sentences that ended in an unexpected word and you can see at the moment the unexpected word is presented that we get a deflection in the ERP. We get a peak. Well, it appears at, as a peak in this figure because they chose to plot the negative direction upwards. So this is an artifact remaining from the time where EEG was plotted on graph paper, that negative would point upwards. Um, nowadays, we just plot negative downwards, but this is an old figure. Um, so even though it appears as a peak, uh, it's actually a valley, and hence it's called the N400 potential. It's a valley occurring around 400 milliseconds after the onset of the final word. And this is interesting, because the only difference in um, experimental condition here was the semantic content of the word, was the meaning of the word. The, the font size was the same, the number of letters didn't really differ. The only difference here is the meaning. So this is a component that's reflecting the time at which the brain is processing the meaning of a word. And this was the first time uh, such a component was ever shown. Now in this study, they also had a third condition, just to tell this apart, where they would render the final word in a slightly larger font. So now it's visually different from the rest. And you can see that has a completely different type of ERP response to it. So they named it here the P560, and it's, it's not that interesting, actually. So now let's take a look at the difference waveform. We obtain that by subtracting the ERP responses to congruent sentences from the ERP response to incongruent sentences. And this is what you get. 
This is also from their paper. They did this for each individual subject, so each volunteer in their experiment, and they plotted them on top of each other. And then they could compute what is known as the grand average. A grand average is not only an average across epochs, but also an average across volunteers. So now we have loads of epochs averaged together, so you get a very clean signal. And you can have a very nice um, view here of the N400 potential, occurring roughly in 400 milliseconds after onset. Again, negativity is plotted upwards here, so it's actually a valley and not a peak. I did some research myself on this N400 potential during my PhD. Um, and one of the experiments I did um, was to try if the N400 would still show up if you only used word pairs, if you used sentences of only two words. Um, and I showed the words in the same manner as uh, Marta Kutas and uh, Stephen Hilliard did. Um, and recorded EEG and cut epochs. And these are the ERP responses to the second word of the pair. And here I show the difference between word pairs that were closely related to each other, like apron and kitchen and wallet and money, dairy and milk, in contrast to word pairs where the words were completely unrelated, like blue, fast, sports, needle, honey, zoo, and this is again the grand average, so it's averaged across 15 volunteers. So we have loads of epochs efforts here together, we get a nice clean signal, and you can clearly see that yes, the N400 effect is still there. And in my plots, I do plot negativity downwards, so in my plots it's actually a valley and not a peak. But I took it a step further, I did not only include words that were related and unrelated, but also intermediate levels of relatedness. This is based on the research of Dr. Simon de Dene, currently at the University of Melbourne. And I believe he will also be giving a guest lecture to you. And he knows everything about computing this so-called association strength, how strongly related are two words. So in this study, I used the values he computed to get a range of word pairs, ranging from completely unrelated and slightly more related ever until they were really closely related. And you can see that the strength of the N400 potential, it is modulated by how closely related these words are. So it's not a binary signal, yes or no, related, unrelated. It actually also tells you the strength of the relationship between words. And this makes it a very interesting brain potential because it's generated at the moment that the brain needs to translate between a word like dog to the actual semantic meaning of that word, to like a, a furry animal with four paws and a tail that barks. And this is a very intricate, complex process and the N400 is one of the few windows we have to look at it and examine it in the brain. This type of experiment in which we use pairs of stimuli which are similar in some way is called a priming experiment. So in the case of my N400 experiments, it was a semantic priming experiment. But we can use other types of stimuli that are similar in some way and systematically start probing what kind of things the brain finds similar and dissimilar at various times. And this allows us to map out the time course of what kind of processing the brain is doing when it's reading a single word. So we've already seen that the N400 potential is indicative of semantic processing and it occurs around 400 milliseconds after we show the word. But what happens before that? Well, decades of studies have carefully mapped out this process, so let's take a look at some of these studies. Here is an interesting study by Kaunchi Holcomb and Granger in 2008. 
And they did a priming experiment with words that were repeated and words that were not repeated. In addition to that, sometimes they would render the repeating word at a different font size, and sometimes they would render the repeating word in a different font. So the question becomes, at what time does the brain regard two words that have the same letters but are rendered in a different font size or a different font as the same? Is a table still a table if it's written in a larger font or if it's written in a different font? Let's take a look at their results. So they found that roughly 150 milliseconds after they showed the second word, the ERP started showing a difference. So whenever a stimulus, for example, the word table, was repeated exactly the same, in the same font, at the same size, we get a very high peak at 150 milliseconds. And this peak gets slightly lower if the font is the same and the size is the same, but the letters are different. For example, table, mouth. But the difference becomes even larger when we have the same word, we still have table, but now we render table in a different font. So at this point in time, the brain does not regard a table the same as a table if the two words are rendered in a different font. And of course, when there are two different words and they're also rendered in different fonts, this is not the same. So how about the condition where they were rendered in different sizes? Again, we see a similar picture appearing. Only when the stimulus was repeated in exactly the same size and letters, we get the highest peak. When we change the letters, but we keep the size the same and the font the same, the peak gets a little bit weaker. It gets weaker still if we start messing with the font size. So at this point, a table is not a table if the second table is rendered in a larger font size. And of course, again, when you change both the letters around and the font size around, you get the largest effect. So this would indicate that this potential, which they call the N150, would indicate basic visual processing. No matter what we do with the stimulus, um, any visual change to the stimulus results in a difference in this N150. There were some other researchers that took this idea even further and um, looked at the positioning of the word. So here I show you the base case. So either a word is repeated or not, table, 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 mouth, and we see a nice difference in the N150. Right? We see a priming effect. But what happens when we shift the second word one position to the left or one position to the right. So it's the same word, it's the same letters, it's the same font, it's the same font size, but the positioning of the word in your visual field is slightly shifted. And what you see is that the priming effect disappears. So at this point, the, for the brain, a table is not a table if the second table is shifted slightly to the left or slightly to the right. So even more evidence that this 150 potential indicates very basic visual processing. So let's pencil that in, in our timeline. 150 related to basic visual processing. Almost any visual change that we make to the stimulus will result in a change in our brain signal. Okay, let's move a bit forward in time. And let's discuss an orthographic priming experiment by Holcomb and Granger. So here, again, we have word pairs. But in this experiment, 
The first word is always written in lowercase letters and the second word is always written in uppercase letters, which for many letters have a completely different shape. So thinking back of the N150, um, for the N150, these would be two completely different things because visually they are different. But we know at some point, the brain must reconcile this difference. A T must still be a T, whether it's upper or lower case, at some point in the time, of course. So that's what they were trying to get at with this experiment. So they have a couple of different cases here. So either the word is repeated, but now in uppercase, or the words were completely different, or the words were almost the same, but for a single changed letter. Almost the same, but not quite. And you can see here that slightly later in the signal, and they call it the N250, this is where we get really the effect of this. So at this point, the amount of orthographic overlap, how many letters are different, this dictates the strength of the N250 potential. And for this potential, it doesn't matter whether a letter is lowercase or uppercase. This is now reconciled. So a table is the same as a table written in uppercase, but a table is slightly different from a table, but only slightly because there's only one letter difference, and mouth and table are even more different. So let's mark this in our timeline as well. N250, at this point, the brain is doing orthographic processing. A T is the same as a T, whether it's upper or lower case. But look, slightly later in the time course, we have this P325 component. So that's interesting because at this time point, we see a large difference between the case where a word is repeated, table, table, and when a word is completely different, mouth table. But even if we change a single letter in the word, so table table, this nuance disappears. A table table is now just as different as mouth table was. And that is because table is not a valid word. It's a non-word. So at this point, they found that the brain is doing sort of a dictionary lookup. It's translating between the orthography of a word, the letters of a word, to the actual entry in your mental lexicon. And at this point, it mostly matters whether the word is part of your lexicon or not. And it doesn't matter that much whether the word is similar to a word you may know or not. So let's add that to our timeline as well. Lexicon access at around 325 milliseconds. So let's take a look at another study by Kiyonaga, Migli, Holcomb and Granger. Again, they were showing written word pairs. And in this study, they took a look whether it mattered, whether words were existing valid words or they were word-like, they were pseudo-words non-existing words. This was done in French. And let's first take a look at the situation where a word was repeated, regardless of whether the word was a valid French word or not. Now look at the N250. In the N250, we see a clear priming effect, repetition effect, irregardless whether the word was a, a valid French word or not. Compare the black and blue lines versus the green and red lines. But now take a look at the P325, at the red line. The red line suddenly takes a dive. So now the contrast becomes much more about whether it was a valid French word than whether the exact same letters were repeated. So this is further evidence that the P325 
is trying to access your mental lexicon. It's trying to resolve the letters that you see into one of the words that you know. And then later, at the end for 100, we know that the actual semantics is being accessed. So, let's review. We first get to basic visual processing. And there we see any change that we make to the stimulus that's visual in nature will have a difference on our ERP. So, we see differences when words are written in a different font, words are rendered at a different size, we see, of course, differences when letters are shuffled about. And of course, we see differences when the words consist of different letters. Then moving on to the N250, it no longer matters in which font the word is written. It no longer matters at which size the word is rendered. Of course, it does matter which letters are rendered there. But at this stage, no difference is made yet between real words and pseudo words. Moving on to the P325, we see a lexicon lookup. So again, it doesn't matter to which font a word is rendered, it doesn't matter at which size. So, but now we also see that all non-existing words are piled in one heap of non-interesting. So we can have stimuli that have different letters and still regard it the same as in, it's not a word, I don't care. But at this stage, synonyms are still different. So a sofa is not equal to a couch yet. That comes later. At the N400, we really get to the semantics. What does the word actually mean? So there we see that words that are synonyms to each other are also treated the same by the brain. So here, a sofa becomes the same thing as a couch. We get to the abstract semantic representation of the word. And we've come to the second break in this lecture. Take a few minutes to relax. Pause the video and I will see you in five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever you feel like. this N400 potential generated in the brain. Now we know the timing, roughly 400 milliseconds after onset, but where are these postsynaptic potentials generated? Well, one way to get a rough idea would be to make a topo plot. Every sensor in the EEG cap is given a name and there, there, there are standard conventions for these names. The names of the electrodes are based on the, the name of the brain lobe that the sensor is currently on top of. So we see that the sensors in the front are all starting with F for the frontal lobe. And then on the sides we have the temporal sensors and at the back we get the parietal sensors and finally the occipital sensors. Now, if we have these standard names for the electrodes, we also have standard positions for them. And this is the reason why in a montage video, you saw them measuring the head of the volunteer. So they could position the cap so that the electrode positions would line up to the standard template very well. So now we can make a topographic map. We can make this for one instance in time. And at that time instance, we take all the values for the different sensors. And remember, these sensors measure the difference in electric potential between the sensor that we're looking at and a reference electrode. 
So that value we plot on the hat like this. And then the values in between the sensors we interpolate. So we do 2D interpolation between the values. And then we get a map like this. And you can get a rough idea of how the differences in electric potential are distributed across the head. But these types of plots, they are very common in scientific articles, but they're also a little bit misleading. Because this would lead you to believe that the N400 potential is generated somewhere at the back of the head, that it is parietal. But this is actually not the case. It is way more complicated than this. To illustrate this, I here have a model of the human brain. And you're looking here at the boundary between the white matter and the gray matter. And this surface is really the underside of the cortex. And I've marked two locations here for you. These locations are quite close, as you can see. But because of the folding of the cortex, sources that are active in these two locations, they will produce currents in completely opposite directions. Now, using this model, I can simulate how the EEG data would look like. And you can see in the two topo maps above that the two locations would appear quite differently in your EEG signal. And this is just because of the folding of the cortex. So it's not always straightforward to look at a topo map and reason about the location of the source in the brain. So what would it take to go from sensors that we record at the electrodes in a cap to a source origin inside the brain? Well, the first step is to get an MRI scan of the participant's head. You put the participant in the scanner and start taking pictures of slices of the head. And by stacking all these slices on top of each other, we can create a computer model of the volunteer's head. And not only of the outside, but also of the various tissue types inside of the head. And now with this model, we can compute what is called the lead field. We can compute how electric currents would flow through the head. And with a lead field, we can try to solve the problem of taking a signal recorded at the sensors in the cap and localizing it to its cortical origin. Now, even with a detailed 3D model of the participant's head, if you try to do this with EEG signals, the results are not great. It turns out that electric currents are distorted quite a bit through all the tissue samples. And even small inaccuracies in the model will lead you to completely different conclusions of the origins of the signal in the brain. So to tell you more about the neural origins of the event-related potentials we've been looking at, I want to introduce you to EEG's big sister. It's called magnetoencephalography. It is a technique that was invented right here at Aalto University, where I am working right now. Instead of recording differences in electric potential, magnetoencephalography records the tiny, tiny magnetic fields that are generated inside your head and inside the room and in the room next to it and everywhere. So what we do is replace the participants in a magnetically shielded room. And we bring sensors very close to their head. And these sensors are called magnetometers. They are very sensitive sensors of the magnetic field. And they have to be kept in a superconducting state. 
which means we have to cool them down with liquid helium. But all this effort is worth it, because magnetic fields are much less distorted by all the tissues in the brain. They move much more in a straight line outward from the head towards the helmet. And we still need the detailed 3D model, but now we have the pieces in place to actually attempt to localize the sources in the brain. Now, this brings us to the final study I wish to discuss with you today. This is a study performed by Vartiainen, Lilleström, Koskinen, Renval, and Salmelin in 2011. Now, this was not a priming study. They showed isolated visual stimuli. And there were five different types of stimuli used. First up, we have valid Finnish words. Then we have Finnish pseudo words, words that look like Finnish words, but are not actively used Finnish words. Then we have consonant strings that do not look like words. They're obviously non-words, but they are letters. Then we have symbol strings that are a bit letter-like shapes, but they're not part of the Finnish alphabet. They're not valid letters, but you can imagine that to a visual system, they may look very similar. And finally, we have words embedded in a huge amount of visual noise. So it drowns out the words. You can sort of make out there's still something buried in there, but you can't read the word anymore. So they presented these types of stimuli to the participant in an MAG scanner, and then they source localized the activity. And they group their findings into three phases in time, which also correspond to three different brain locations that were active. And you can see them here. I've drawn the activation on top of a brain that I have inflated like a balloon. So you can look into all the nooks and crannies of the cortex. Now the first group and on top of this activation, I've drawn in white circles the location of peak activity for a participant. The study had 15 participants, so I have 15 white circles on top of there. You can see that the location of peak activity is slightly different for each participant. Well, each brain is different. It's very normal. Now, for the first group, we see that for all the participants, the, the peak activation is clustered right on the visual cortex. And the timing of the peak activity is quite fast after the onset of the stimulus. It's roughly 100 milliseconds after. Now, the second phase of the signal occurs a little bit later. And now also a little, little bit more frontal. So we're now more in the occipital temporal regions of the brain. And finally, we have a third phase where a signal appears that is much later in time, between 300 and 500 milliseconds, and is now really temporal. It's even more frontal in the brain. We get it now on the temporal cortex. Now this transition from back of the brain more to the front, going along the left side of the brain. This is a very common pattern that you see, uh, visual stimuli taking, and it's called the ventral stream, the ventral processing stream. And now let's take a look at the time courses of the signal in these locations. So here I've shown for each of these three locations, the entire time course of the ERP at this location. Again, this is average across all the stimuli belonging to a certain group and all the participants. We're looking here at grand averages. Now, for the first phase of the signal, we see that it peaks at the visual cortex quite early on. But now look at the response to the different types of stimuli. We see that the signal 
speaks most strongest to the noisy words. So the words that were embedded in this visual noise. And we see for the other, all the other types of stimuli, the signal is roughly the same. So this corresponds well to what we saw in the EEG results. This is an ERP component that is related to basic visual processing. It cares about the visual complexity of the stimulus. And when we add noise, we increase the visual complexity by a lot. Moving up further in time and further along the ventral stream, we get to the left occipital temporal phase. And now at this location, the signal peaks slightly later, let's say roughly 170 milliseconds after onset. But look at the behavior of this signal. Whereas noisy words had a very strong response before, now it's actually the weakest response. And we can also now see a difference in the signal, a response to stimuli that contained letters and stimuli that did not contain letters, the symbols that were very much like letters, but they are not part of the Finnish alphabet. And this brain region distinguishes between that. It distinguishes between letters that are part of the Finnish alphabet and symbols. And for the final phase, we see a signal that peaks around 400 milliseconds. And this actually corresponds to the N400 signal we have been analyzing with EEG. So now you see where it actually originates from. It originates from the temporal reasons. It doesn't originate from the parietal part of the brain at all, as you may have thought looking at the topo plot of the EEG. And let's take a look how it responds. So again, we see that noisy words do not have a strong peak here at all, but we also see that both symbol strings and consonant strings do not evoke a strong response here anymore. Only stimuli that really look like words now activate these regions. And we see that for the N400, it tries to get at the semantic meaning of a word. So you may ask, why does it still respond to pseudo words? It actually responds a little bit more to pseudo words than actual valid Finnish word. And that is because it's difficult to tell them apart. For consonant strings, it's immediately obvious they, they are not words, so they get dropped immediately. But in order to decipher whether a pseudo word is actually a word or not, that takes effort. So you see that the N400 still peaks quite largely here. So, in summary, we've seen that through priming studies, we can map out the time course of word processing. And we've taken a look at some of the results. Various peaks and valleys in the ERP can be associated with different processing steps going from basic visual processing to orthographic processing to lexical access to semantics. Now, this is, of course, a very simplistic overview of the process. And you can imagine that as we do more studies, that we get a more complete but also more complicated picture of the entire process. But at any rate, you can now appreciate the way that event-related potentials can help us in cognitive studies of the brain. Now, we've also discussed how to deduce the cortical origin of the ERP signal, and that this is quite difficult to do by just looking at the EEG data. Now, things improve when we take an MRI scan of the participant's head and construct a 3D model. But even with such a model, localizing EEG signals is hard. It's easier to localize MEG signals, and that's what we've been taking a look at. And MEG reveals that the cortical origins of the event-related potentials we've been looking at are generated along the ventral processing stream in the brain. I've been talking about EEG now for an hour and a half, and it's time for me to wrap up this lecture. However, there's one last thing I want to give to you. But this is optional. For those of you who are really interested in EEG and data analysis and this sort of neuroscience -y stuff, 
I've set up an online learning environment for you in which you can perform a basic ERP analysis yourself. I've placed within that environment a snippet of EEG data that was recorded during one of my magic car trick experiments. And my challenge to you is given this EEG data, can you figure out which of the nine playing cards the participant was thinking about during the experiment? And you will find that to answer this question, you will need to do a bit of computer programming. Now, I've been told that you are third year students, so I can imagine that some of you have never programmed a computer before. But this is the simple truth of data analysis. If you want to do data analysis in any serious form, you have to be able to program your computer. You don't have to be an expert professional software engineer, but you need to know the basics of how to tell your computer what to do. And the way you do this is by using a programming language. Now, in the online environment, I don't assume any prior programming experience. I will start from the very beginning and we will work our way up to a simple ERP analysis of EEG data. So again, this is completely optional for you, but if you're interested in this sort of things, I invite you to take a look. And that's all folks, I'm going home. I hope you've learned something and I wish you the best of luck in your studies and your future career. Bye now.